for the call now news from the podcast in the past week we've had our biggest numbers yet believe it or not we've had more listeners this week on the podcast than we did in the previous three months we are the top listened to alternative media political podcast in the world charting in the political top 20 in the UK Ireland Spain Italy India, Russia, Germany, Belgium, Turkey, Denmark, Cyprus, Hungary, Qatar, Poland, Portugal, Nigeria, Egypt, the Philippines, Hong Kong, Thailand, Taiwan, Singapore, Sweden, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and Israel. <laughs> How about that then? For a guy from a council house in Dundee, we're quickly becoming one of the top political podcasts in China also. And we're still number one in Ghana, Oman, Namibia, Ecuador, Slovenia, Zimbabwe, Malaysia, but also now in Bulgaria and in Iceland. What of the United States of America? Well, in the run-up to the presidential election, allegedly won by Joe Biden by a handsome margin. A story emerged which polling suggests would have altered the outcome by a clear 10% of the vote or more, which would have meant that Donald Trump was the president of the United States now and not the quite evidently senile Alzheimer patient. Joe Biden. What was that story? That story was that a laptop unbelievably left in a repair shop by the first son of the President of the United States, Hunter Biden is his name, had contained material on it so horrific uh, that Hunter Biden should be in a penitentiary for the rest of his life. The first son of the United States of America is revealed in that laptop as a sick pervert with a taste in child pornography. He is revealed as a sick drug addict addicted to crack cocaine. So much so bad you could say his father's not responsible for the sick practices of his son. But there's other stuff on the laptop too. You see, Hunter Biden was not just up to his neck in vice and class A drugs. He was up to his neck in business in Ukraine, in Burisma the oil and gas company in Ukraine, which is where this whole sordid story of the Ukraine begins. People don't want you to know that. They moved mountains to make sure that you did not know that. They banned the newspapers who uncovered the story. They deplatformed them. They took them off Twitter, off Facebook. 51 Intelligence officers of the United States, 51, testified that this laptop story was Russian disinformation. That the big guy referred to in documents on the laptop who had to be satisfied financially in the negotiations between Hunter Biden and the oligarchs of Ukraine, the big guy could not have been the vice president of the United States as was Joe Biden when the coup that overthrew the elected government in Kiev took place. The big guy couldn't have been Joe. Hunter couldn't have been the guy extorting millions of dollars from the oligarchy in Ukraine. This was all Russian disinformation until it wasn't. The New York Times this week 
published a story epochal in its importance in which they finally confessed that the suppression of the Hunter Biden laptop story had been wrong. Uh, that the material on the laptop had been authentic. That Hunter Biden was a sick sexual criminal, drug addict, and up to his neck in corruption in the Ukraine. And that the whole sick story of the coup and everything that has happened since was ineluctably, inextricably linked to what must now be called the Biden crime family. I've got to tell you that if Americans knew, as they will, slowly but surely, that Donald Trump had been right when he said, Joe Biden is a criminal, and you, the news media, are also criminals for failing to report it. Donald Trump was right. Imagine that. Trump, a passing stranger with the truth. Trump himself, Hardly a paragon of virtue either on the sexual front or on the corruption front. Donald Trump was the one telling the truth. The Bidens, who gave you their word as, as a Biden, were lying. The intelligence community was lying. The deep state in the United States was lying. The Democrats were lying, CNN was lying, the media was lying, and Donald Trump was telling the truth. Just imagine if that story in the run-up to the presidential election had not been suppressed, how different the world would look today. I'll be taking your calls and I'll be talking to some brave and brilliant people over the next two and a half hours and more, because this is the mother of all talk shows. <music> Gonzalo Lira, welcome uh, on board the show. Uh, give us an idea of you, if you will, of the current state of play in your city. Uh, yeah, I'm in Kharkov, I'm in the center of the city. And uh, yeah, today, as a matter of fact, I did a little tour of it. And it's um, the long and short of it is that the at this time, uh, we're a little bit over almost four weeks into this invasion, three and a half weeks. And it's clear that the um, Russians are winning. And the way that they have been conducting this war is more or less what I said at the very beginning of this conflict, which was the Russians don't seek to destroy Ukraine. They seek to capture it, capture it whole, and as, as with as little damage as possible given the circumstances. And the other thing, too, is that they are trying to capture the Ukraine army. Now, that might not seem like what they're doing to people who don't understand military matters, but the way that the Russians have been conducting this war, it's clear that they, their intention is to capture both the country and the Ukrainian armed force. And within the Ukrainian armed force, there are the, uh, quite frankly, the fascist element. Um, and, and, and I do not say that lightly. Uh, you know, there are many people who just, uh, you know, accuse anybody that they don't like of being a fascist. I mean, last I heard on Twitter, J.K. Rowling is a fascist because of, uh, of her opinions on, on, on various matters. No, these are actual fascists, and they are proud of it. And uh, these fascists were instrumental in the 2014 coup d'etat. And after 2014, they were supposedly disbanded, but what, what actually happened was that they were absorbed into the Ukrainian armed forces at all levels, at all, in all units. They weren't discrete units uh, within the uh, Ukrainian armed forces. There are certain battalions, the, uh, famously the Azov Battalion and the Aidan Battalion, that are independent units, but for the most part, these uh, fascist elements are spread out throughout the Ukrainian armed forces. And these are the people that the Russians uh, very badly want to take out. Uh, they want to preserve the Ukrainian armed force for later. 
because it's very clear that the Russians have no intention of conquering and absorbing Ukraine. They want it to be an independent state, but simply friendly to them, friendly to, to Russia. And by the way, uh, my commentary on in so far as this conflict is concerned, I have to emphasize this point, if you, if you will allow me. My, my interest is to make this conflict as short as possible with as little loss of life as possible. And that's why I try to be as realistic as possible, because I think that what happened is that the Ukrainian leadership, the EU and the United States and NATO, they led the Ukrainian people down the garden path, the, the primrose path of believing that Ukraine would one day join NATO, join the EU, and that once that happened, they would all be rich and happy and it would be a wonderful life. And because of this, uh, they goaded the Russians. The Ukrainian government goaded the Russians, and it got to a point where the Russians realized that no promise made by the West would ever be fulfilled, you know, specifically the Minsk agreements that were signed in 2014 and, and were never fulfilled, and and the, the uh, Zelensky regime and the previous uh, regime would stretch out and just sort of like ignore and just not do what was supposed to be done vis-a-vis -vis the agreement. And so the Russians realized this on the one hand, and on the other hand, they realized that the Ukraines and what is appearing now to be the trigger for this conflict, the Ukraines seem to have been on the brink of invading the Donbass. Uh, and they had amassed their army on the east, on the, uh, right on the contact line. And remember when the United States and Europe kept saying that the Russians were surrounding Ukraine, were amassing troops uh, on the border with Ukraine. Well, it was a weird kind of projection because that's what the Ukraine armed forces were doing. They were amassing their armies in the east for a final conquest of the breakaway republics of Lugansk and Donetsk. And what happened was that the, the Russians, in essence, beat them to the punch. And that's why because they were amassed there on the east, right on the contact line. That's why the Russians have been able to encircle that army, which numbers some 60,000 soldiers. And it's very important to understand these are 60,000 frontline combat troops. They've surrounded them. They're actually in, in several, in about four different cauldrons, they're called, which is basically pockets that are surrounded by Russian forces. And the... Um, the Russians basically have cut off the major cities, Kiev, uh, Kharkov, uh, Mariupol, Lugansk, um, Donetsk. They've cut them off. Well, Lugansk and Donetsk are now under control of the Russians, but they've cut off the cities and cut off the armies. There's no longer a centralized defensive strategy by the Ukrainians. And so it's just a matter of time when you have a divided army and divided defenses, that's what's currently happening. It's just a matter of time before the the, the attacking forces, in this case, the Russians, uh, they're gonna take over. And by the way, the reason they call this strategy the cauldron, because what they do is they surround a, a pocket of resistance or a group of soldiers or a city, they surround it and then slowly start turning up the heat, like on a cauldron. And it's a famous strategy that the Russians have employed from the beginning of the 19th century. It's nothing new. It's slow, grinding, methodical. And uh, this is how the Russians are winning this conflict. And what's really interesting is that so many people in the commentariat in the West think that the Russians are losing. And you, you wonder why, because the Russians are taking over towns. The Russians are advancing troops. And you're trying to understand why do the very, very smart people in the West think that the Russians are losing? And then you understand why. And it took me a while for me to figure it out. Uh, because we are so used to, over the last 30 years, that when the Americans go to war, how do they go to war? They send their air force to completely bombard a city, destroy it, annihilate it. They start with the infrastructure, with the electrical grid, uh, telephony, then they go after water mains, heating, uh, uh, you know, heating systems, whatnot. They just systematically destroy all of the infrastructure in the city. And this causes enormous damage to the civilian population, which is either killed or left homeless or flees. And, uh, and once they have 
softened up, quote unquote, a city like this, which is just basically annihilating the city, then the Americans or NATO or call them what you will, the, the global American empire, the GAE, they roll in in essentially a mopping up operation. They've destroyed the city and then they roll in and take it over. And, and of course, by that time, there's no resistance whatsoever and the pockets of resistance are trivial. But the Russians don't fight the war like that. They're not interested in destroying the cities. On the contrary, they want to maintain the cities and minimize civilian casualties as much as they can. What they want to do is to neutralize the opposing armed force. And notice, it's neutralized, not destroy. The Russians are just as happy if somebody surrenders or if an opposing army deserts. They're, they're not trying to kill. They're trying to uh, uh, eliminate the threat that the opposing armed force poses. And so that mentality, um, frankly, is far more humane. And it makes you realize that the American mode of war that we, have, we in the West have become accustomed to over the last 30 years is really despicable. I mean, you, you start to realize, uh, I am a conservative. Uh, politically, I am conservative. But you and I are, are uh, probably on opposite sides of the spectrum in, on a whole host of issues. But when I used to hear um, men of the left, such as yourself, say that you know George Bush was a war criminal and Bill Clinton was a war criminal and, and, and all the rest of it, I was like, yeah, 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 okay. But comparing the way the Russians carry out a war and comparing it to how the Americans have carried out a war, I stand corrected. I have to fully agree that the American leaders, people like Tony Blair, like uh, George W. Bush, they truly are war criminals. They, they committed unspeakable atrocities um, that served no purpose. They, they, they were just, it was wanton destruction. Because I'm seeing how the Russians are carrying out the war. I am in the middle of Kharkov, and I am speaking to you over cell phone. I have internet. I have running water. I have sewage. I have heat, which is crucial in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, electricity, of course. I mean, everything is normal because the Russians did not go out to destroy the civilian infrastructure. They are not trying to conquer cities. They're trying to neutralize the opposing armed force. And you realize that this is the civilized way of waging war. I mean, war is by definition uh, violent and barbaric, but there are degrees of barbarism. And this is as humane as possible, the way that they are carrying it out. And then you realize that analysts in the West, since they're so used to this total destruction and annihilation of cities and, and the complete uh, um, ruin of the people that uh, are being conquered, then you realize that, yeah, of course, from their point of view, since the Russians are not destroying everything in their path, they're quote unquote, losing the war, which is, you know, the, the situation we're at. Anyway, I've ranted a little bit. Um, ask me- No, you haven't. It's I'll been, uh, it's briefer. been uh, absolutely uh, riveting, fascinating. Uh, may I ask uh, why you're there? Why you're sure, there in Kasko? ask away. Please, uh, yeah, what, uh, how, well, did, I, you, um, how did you end up our man in Kharkiv? Uh, well, uh, what happened, I am from Chile. Uh, <laughs> my accent doesn't make it sound that way. Uh, and I grew up, I spent a lot of time in the United States. My father worked in finance and I went to university in the United States. So I went to Dartmouth and I worked in Hollywood as a writer and then I published novels. and. Uh, and, and then got involved into different businesses. And in, what was it, 2011, I, uh, 2012, I uh, met a Ukrainian woman um, in Germany because I had some friends in Germany and uh, I went to visit them and I was living in Paris at the time. And, uh, and you know, the, the usual happened, you know, fell in love, she was the au pair of these acquaintances and uh, fell in love and, you know, now we have a couple of kids. Uh, and, uh, well, they are far away from me at this time. And we came to move, to live here in 2016 because um, her family is from here. And uh, I thought it would be you know, nice to live here for a while. And then I, I had different businesses that I had to attend to in London and Amsterdam. And so this was like a good base of operation while the kids grew up and learned Russian and Ukrainian. 
And, uh, and well, this situation arose and it caught me personally. I was in Kiev. Um, I, was, I went out to Kiev on some trivial business, uh, just some residency stuff that I had to take care of. And uh, I was supposed to be there for two nights, and I arrived the day before the invasion. So I had uh, front row seats to that. And um, insofar as the, the invasion, I, I've had this hobby of being a YouTuber, and I was winding it down last year. Um, late last year, I was just winding it down because, you know, I'd had a good run. It was fun. But what happened was that I started um, reporting on what, what was going on in Kiev. And I would go up and down Krishatik Avenue, um, videotaping myself and showing the sights as the war developed. And uh, what I noticed early on that made me no friends among many people was that the uh, Zelensky regime was handing out uh, firearms willy-nilly to the population. In the end, they distributed something like 10,000 weapons. And at the time, I thought that this was exceedingly dangerous because you, you, you don't know who you're giving these weapons to. And these civilians who are going to use these weapons, they don't know how to use them because it's not enough to know how to shoot a gun. You have to know how to move with as a team. You know, I mean, it's, there's a reason that soldiers train. It's, it's not just picking up a gun and aiming and shooting. You have to know how to move, know how to react so that you are effective and don't injure yourself or other people. And so I thought it was crazy. And I said that criminals were going to get these weapons and lo and behold, they got them. And I witnessed how uh, there were shootouts in Kiev. I witnessed them, not that I saw them, I heard them. I, I would hear, uh, you know, uh, automatic fire in downtown Kiev. And the distance of it was not more than say 250 meters to 500 meters on the outside at a time when it was known that the closest uh, uh, Russian fighters were 30, 40 kilometers away. So it was obvious that what was happening was that these weapons fell into the hands of criminals, as has been later confirmed. And these criminals started using them on the civilian population, on, on each other, setting scores and whatnot. And that's why I started paying attention to the Zelensky regime, because as a foreigner in Ukraine, um, as a foreigner in any country, quite frankly, I think it's wrong for a foreigner uh, to, um, you know, be discussing and having an opinion about the local governance. After all, you're a guest. And so my, my thinking has been always like when I go to somebody's house as a guest, I don't tell them, you know, to change the wallpaper or why do they have the furniture the way that they do. It's their business. And if I like it or don't like it, I have to just keep it to myself. That's always been my attitude. And so insofar as the uh, Ukrainian political situation is concerned, I never had an opinion and I never really paid attention to it deliberately so that I would never fall into this trap of having an opinion where I'm a guest and, and not a citizen, where, where as a resident, I'm allowed certain privileges, but I, I'm not able to vote, I'm not able to change, and, and I shouldn't. I mean, that's, that's me, that's my, my opinion, uh, or the way I, I, I think one ought to handle oneself as a guest in the country. But when the invasion happened, I started paying attention to the Zelensky regime for the first time. And I started doing some digging on the Zelensky regime. And I realized that Zelensky himself is an actor and he is literally a puppet. He was put into position by a, a Ukrainian Israeli Cypriot oligarch by the name of Igor Kolomoisky, who is a nasty character. Uh, this, this oligarch has basically created a television program called Servant of the People and cast Zelensky as the lead and artificially inflated this television program by bribing people and getting a lot of publicity for this show, even though the show in and of itself is fairly mediocre. But it got a lot of people's attention and Zelensky as a puppet was positioned by Kolomoisky and his various associates in the entertainment industry, because Kolomoisky was the owner or, or principal owner of One Plus One Media, which is the largest media company in Ukraine. And they positioned Zelensky uh, to be this uh, figure, because in the television show, the, the 
the Zelensky president of the TV show wants to join the EU and wants to join NATO and sells the dream that Ukraine will be wonderful and will end the corruption in Ukraine if this happens. And so uh, Zelensky is uh, um, in the TV show. He was like the ideal candidate. And so this was transitioned into reality. They even made a political party called Serpent of the People to support Zelensky's candidacy. And, you know, he won the election uh, by, by basically lying to the people and telling them that he would get them to the EU, he would solve the corruption problems, which are very serious in Ukraine, uh, that, you know, he, he sold them a bit, bill of goods that he could not possibly deliver. And people, unfortunately, bought this story and they elected him. And quite quickly, he started acting despotically. He, um, one of the measures that he did was that he banned um, channels, television channels that were critical of him or of his uh, regime, he banned four of them, as a matter of fact, uh, what, where before he had said that the Russian language should be allowed and it was wrong to prohibit the Russian language. Once he became president, he outlawed the Russian language. Um, and it was very clear that Kolomoisky, the, the oligarch, he was the man, along with other oligarchs, who had funded the Azov Battalion and other far-right neo-Nazi movements in Ukraine that had been instrumental in the 2014 Maidan coup. And it's very odd. This is that let me let me Jewish let, let me stop you there. Yeah, it's uh, it's more yes. than it's more than odd. It is uh, grotesque uh, that the yes. fascists uh, should be mm -hmm. being funded by. Uh, a Ukrainian oligarch who is Jewish. But in the Zelensky's yeah, to the Knesset, uh, he, uh, let me uh, draw your attention to a very different uh, Israeli point of view. Caroline Glick, uh, an Israeli mm -hmm. writer and editor, said this this evening after Zelensky's speech to the Knesset. And th I'm quoting mm -hmm. her. Uh, the claim by Zelensky uh, that the Ukrainians were uh, righteous Gentiles who tried to protect us from the Holocaust mm -hmm. is a revolting mm -hmm. piece of historical revisionism. She said yes. uh, that the Jews in Ukraine were massacred not in Poland, mm -hmm but in Ukraine and by their neighbors. The truth of the matter mm -hmm. is that a, a significant, not the majority, a significant part uh, of particularly Western Ukraine has historically mm -hmm. been anti-Semitic to its core and fell upon. Yes its own Jewish population and massacred them even before the SS trains arrived to take them to the death camps. And I take my hat off to yes. Caroline Glick this evening. She called out Zelensky's lies that somehow Nazism and fascism and anti-Semitism are somehow alien uh, to the uh, nationalist forces in Ukraine, when the absolute opposite is the truth. Am I right? George, you're absolutely right. And George, can I ask you something? What kind of a man can Zelensky possibly be if he himself is Jewish and he is intimately associated with such figures as these? I mean, I, I have to ask somebody here. What do you think of this? I mean, I would be revolted. I, 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 could, not, I could not live with myself on a, on a level of conscious, conscience. Well, I couldn't Hello? either. Alas, we've run out of time, Gonzalo. Uh, uh, stay safe. You're a very brave and smart man, whatever you say, uh, however you uh, answer that. I'm certain, as so are the viewers, I'm sure. Uh, go ahead, Richard. Oh, good evening, George. Thank you very much indeed, sir. I'm absolutely buzzing here. We fought for the Thank last you. five, six years to, to get out of Europe, EU, under the control of Soros and Blair and all these people that are in there that are against uh, 
democracy is the is the only word you yourself george you've suffered under this lot by being fired by blair and then his his, his henchman uh, campbell and so on and, and they excuse the, the the language it got rid of you out of the system that has been gone yeah i'm now. almost almost 20 years out of the system though i did win two famous election victories against them i know and I, I know but you have had to fight on your own virtually george oh my god they, yeah. they, i could show you fighting. my scars rich <laughs> you've been fighting a financial machine that is wow it's it, sure. it's just there all the time billions and billions of people's uh, hands who are using it very very badly the last one of course is sturgeon and we've got to beat her to stop her from getting us back into the eu because that is what all this mm. fight is about and to think that the iraq war and, and and blair he went to america and bush was draining and he said you know and, and he, he told him he said don't worry he said i will spin this war to the world you no need to worry george we're going to war and then when it was all over in a few weeks the, the general said we're not going into afghanistan and blair said yes we bloody well are you can get your money in there and for the last 20 years we've been at war Who's talking about this yes. wonderful man called Blair? He's a warmonger, and he should be in the Hague, George. Well, to, yeah, doubt. I mean, uh, Richard, to put a tin hat on it, him and Gordon Brown are both demanding a war crimes tribunal like Nuremberg uh, for the Russian president. I mean, the, and, the, the lack of <laughs> self-consciousness <laughs> is simply <laughs> staggering, and none of... None of the mainstream journalists, when they say that, ask, well, what about Iraq? What about the yes. fact that you illegally invaded Iraq and you devastated it and the consequences are still being felt today? But Rich, I want to ask you something. You and yes, I sir. were both big supporters of Brexit and yes. I don't resolve from it at all. I'll go to my grave proud of the role I played in the fight yes. for Brexit. But it seems, you did. it seems that there are a lot of people who supported us on Brexit, wanted to end our dependence on the European Union, only for us to become dependent on the United States of America. I want us to be independent, full stop, independent of the EU and independent of Joe Biden. Exactly. But, you know, that's a big thing when you've got trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars against you. You've got the Cl Clinton crime family. You've got Obama. You you've got all the people in the White House. Pelosi. She's nearly dead when she's talking. And these people are controlling the world now, George. And I, I, yep. I, I would... I'd love to sit and talk to you for hours about this because it's got to be known that you said it tonight three times. The president, Trump, was absolutely correct. So Babalinsky, was. who was a good friend of Biden's son, he came on here and he spent days and weeks telling us this is a load of corrupt families that are daily here in UK. Ukraine and everywhere else. It's all been highlighted. And, and I said to my son, well, they won't let President Trump serve another term. And that's what they did. And Hillary Clinton is responsible for Julian Assange being where he is. And she should be incarcerated with Blair. And I know I'm going on a bit, George, but to me, this is so exciting. It's powerful. If, 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 you know, the New York Times come out and then they can get some great lawyers on this, and Giuliani was one of them who, who, who really came to the fore on it. I, I followed this like you. I followed it like, wow, this is right. If we could get President Trump, along with um, um, whichever government was in in England, to do a great big trillion, trillion, trillion dollar deal, it was good for us all. But they wouldn't let us. Joe Biden come on and use the Irish problem, the Irish problem, as an excuse to say that we can't deal uh, with, with Britain anymore. What a shock. But I tell you what, we're proving them wrong. And all these people that Blair is employing or Soros is employing to go to, 
to, to Brussels and to try to get us back in the EU. Do you know what, George? I'll come in the front line with you and we'll have a go at them all and let's get millions on the streets out of the 17.4 million. Because if they do that to us, that's wrong. Richard, very powerful indeed. Thank you very much indeed. James Stevens uh, says, it's come to my notice that Stoltenberg was trying to pressure the Chinese to stop support for Russia. The Chinese reminded him that NATO had bombed the Chinese embassy in Belgrade during its bombing of Serbia. That's from James Stevens. I had to laugh when uh, I saw that Boris Johnson had warned China. They should have answered in the words of Dong Xiaoping uh, to a British official over the issue of Hong Kong. The days when China can be ordered around by foreigners is gone forever. That would have been my answer. Let's go to Washington, D.C. and talk with John. We can't. We can't. Let's go to David in Yorkshire instead. It's a shorter distance. <laughs> go on, David. Hi, George. You all right? All right, sir. Nice to hear from you. Yeah, lovely to hear from you. Yeah, uh, quickly, um, I've, I've got a suggestion. I've been researching um, the Ukrainian situation quite deeply. The oligarchs, uh -huh. Zelensky, how we got into power, um, and you know, right up to the um, Azov Battalion and um, the history of that. Um, and um, I've, I've, I've come up with a conclusion which uh, I'd like to put um, forward as a suggestion to you and something that I'd like you to consider and maybe give feedback to the audience. And that okay, would go be, ahead. Um, w would it be possible of you to consider that um, because globalism has been kind of on the agenda in lots of ways and in lots of countries, um, do, you, do you think at all it would be possible that um, the Ukrainian um, Azov Battalion and the nationalists in that country uh, are being sacrificed by um, the globalists because um, the nationalists, and, and I would see nationalism as being one of the major problems and hold-ups in um, globalism moving forward. Uh, I think that the Azov uh, Battalion, the right sector, uh, the alphabet soup of uh, fascism, uh, in yeah. Ukraine uh, will definitely be crushed. Uh, those yeah. that are not crushed will escape from Ukraine and will turn up uh, on a high street near you, maybe uh, with yeah. a surface-to-air missile in, their, uh, in the back of their car, with a man pad in, in the back of their car. Uh, the uh, belief self-evident in amongst Western leaders, I used to say this yeah. to British Prime Ministers at uh, Prime Minister's Question Time, did you read Frankenstein all the way to the end? Because if you had, you would realize that these monsters you keep creating, in the end, move outside of your control, out with your ability to control it. And the law of unintended consequences, David, is a very powerful law. Thanks for the call. Uh, we've got lots more uh, coming up. Um, let's see. Uh, Chanrai Bishop says, you sound like a madman. Really? You're basically arguing that the Ukrainians do not have a right to exist. Me? There are many nations around the world that don't have a large military. Actually, Ukraine has a massive military, 450,000 strong. It was only 120,000 in 2014, so it's tripled nearly in size in just eight years. I wonder why. I wonder how. Based on what you're saying, a more powerful country has the right to just attack them and take them over. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Mr. Chanrai Bishop, you're going to need to call me and argue this out, man to man. 08081965522. Come and have a go if you think you're hard enough. We'll see who's the madman when you call. <laughs> Uh, 
Let's go to Washington, D.C., talk with John. John, welcome to the show. Yeah, uh, it's just crazy seeing the media blackout here in the United States. Uh, I, I happened to read 1984 for the first time uh, a couple months ago, and I was struck thinking about it afterwards, about how it's assigned to uh, high school students here, at least back in the day. And I think it was as a warning uh, for like Soviet or, or Russian uh, communism and authoritarian government. And but now, from my perspective here, growing up in the United States, it, for me, it was like I finished the book thinking like I felt like I had just been subjected to an MK Ultra experiment or something. And to me, it spoke out against none other than American government. And now, now with the media blackout, having to cut through all the, the, the uh, mass media lies and false coverage to get any semblance of the truth, it's like playing Sudoku. And uh, it's just crazy yeah. to look from the perspective that we're at now and see that 1984, I mean, was written about us, the United States, you know. We are the ones. In well, the uh, he, he didn't intend that to be the case, but that's how it has turned out. 1984 was supposed to be a novel, not a manual. Uh, but the manual yes. is in full application now, uh, particularly in your country and in mine increasingly. In fact, your country and mine are effectively becoming one, uh, albeit in the words of Oscar Wilde, one divided by a common language. Uh, but our rulers are uh, on the same page, uh, so we might as well be on the same page too in how we try to get liberty and freedom back again. Richard, I've kept you waiting long enough. Go ahead, sir. Hi, George. Good evening, and thanks for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Um, Welcome. Yeah, you know, I've been watching this um, Ukrainian crisis for some time now, really pretty much from when it started, obviously, and I've been doing hundreds of hours. <laughs> I do mean hundreds of hours of research because it just sort of caught my interest. I can't explain why, but it did. Good. I um, wish everyone did, Richard. <laughs> and, and I think that, I, it, it, uh, long story short, you know, I've really had a red pill moment, and it's been quite terrifying in a way because I've actually thought a lot of my friends, a lot of my people, the people that I know, in fact, virtually all of them, apart from, I think, one, are all going along with the whole you know the, what what you see in the news you know you, you know evil putin is destroying ukraine is killing millions of people blah 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 it's got to be stopped one of my friends said that we should send in the troops even though you know obviously that would cause you know world war three let's go and you know let's join in and let's get stuck let's get stuck in i was then looking at the sanctions that they imposed and it's sort of started off with a you know you thought oh we'll impose some sanctions and we'll deter Putin and send a, a clear message and then I'm realizing that aside from instead of you know applying a couple of sanctions we seem to be throwing the kitchen sink and then the whole kitchen at him and we've thrown I think literally everything we've got um, and we've actually tried to destroy the Russian economy and probably the Russian nation and then I'm like looking into that and thinking I then did some research on the central banker of Russia. I think it's a lady, and she's highly respected, apparently. And she gave a speech, I don't know, about like a week ago, um, a week ago, and basically said that they think they can mitigate the sanctions and they're going to do this, that, and the other, and they can get around it, and Russia will come out sort of stronger. It obviously will, you know, cause an impact and it will cause, you know, damage to the economy. But they think that they can endure it. And with all of that, I've then been doing all of this research into. You know, why are we in this position and why is the West so keen to basically just send in an incredible amounts of weapons into the country? Why are they not trying to achieve a peace deal? Why are they not focusing on the peace deal? And uh, you're in the UK like I am, and I'm getting very tired and frustrated with seeing Boris Johnson going on TV and, you know, comparing it to Brexit and shouting and screaming about how bad Russia are and how we must finish them off and... You know, Putin must fail and all this kind of rubbish. And then I realized, sort of a deep, bit deeper into it all, and then I thought, well, the Americans seem to be sort of piling in on it as well, thinking it's all great to sort of supply more and more weapons to a war that ultimately I don't think the Ukrainians can, can win. Um, I think the best thing is for, obviously, for them to sit around the table and negotiate a peace deal. And then again, I looked into it, and I believe Putin spelt out 
well, the Russian government spelled out their terms about three weeks ago and said, like, look, this is what we want, sort of thing. Um, but it seems that, long story short, I think the West is not just supporting, which is obviously great, you know, let's support the Ukrainians in their resistance or whatever, but they seem to be encouraging this war, making things sure. worse. Sure. They're, uh, they're ready conflict. to, Richard, they're ready to fight to the last drop of Ukrainian blood. They're not ready to fight themselves. The British and the Americans and NATO will never join this fight because they know that this fight will quickly escalate uh, to World War III, to a nuclear world war. And however stupid Boris Johnson and Joe Biden look, uh, wiser counsel in the military and in the deep state have no intention of uh, of um, entering World War Three because it would be the end, the end, fan. Uh, so um, the uh, the rest of it is just moonshine because not only will uh, Russia survive the sanctions, uh, the people imposing the sanctions have dropped a huge stone on their own feet, and it's our people that are already paying the price uh, or at the petrol pumps, in the gas bills, in the food costs and in the uh, inflation basket and in the banking crisis that will be brought on by all of this. So the idea that uh, you're destroying Russia is simply fanciful. Russia is food self-sufficient. Russia is energy self-sufficient. Russia has the vast hinterland, the biggest country in the world, 11 time zones, and it has a, an alliance, an ironclad alliance, uh, with the two most populous countries in the world. Uh, China and India and other countries like Iran, like Venezuela, which are energy rich and are in close alliance and coordination uh, with Russia. So it's all moonshine, Richard. We've been led over the cliff by Joe Biden. What's wrong with us that we were led over a cliff by a man that is to be found wandering the corridors of the White House in his pajamas, drooling, having toilet accidents in front of the Pope, and we're following him? What's wrong with us? That's what I say. Richard, thanks. Keith is in Grimsby. Let's hear from him. I don't often get up to Grimsby. Keith, last time I was there, I was on BBC Question Time, along with a young backbencher called David Cameron. I wonder what ever happened to him. I don't, I don't know. I never saw it. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, sir. Yes, I agree with all those callers. Uh, it's a wonderful show, and it's very refreshing. After all, it's Thank sitting you, in propaganda on the mainstream media. Thank well, you, sir. Uh, the main thing I, I'm ringing about, um, or two things, in fact, uh, my disappointment at uh, losing RT, I've been watching it for many years now, and like you, I'm a big fan of um, Max Kaiser and his wife, Tracy. Unlike you, Thank I... Thank God um, for them. Thank God for I, them. I didn't take him up on his Bitcoin off all those years ago. Well, uh, luckily I regrets. did. L luckily I, I did, which is why, which is I, why I don't need any I wages. Ask. I don't need any wages from anybody. I, know, I won't ask you how much you. I won't ask you how much you've made. It will spoil my night. <laughs> well, ten dollars. I bought um, them at ten dollars. I bought them at ten dollars, and I've got quite a lot of them. So you can do the maths. I know. I can well imagine. <laughs> Big regrets. God bless. Um, God bless. Been, Max. Like I say, I've been watching RT for many years, and I've always found um, uh, Lavrov and Putin quite reasonable. Quite frankly. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, actually, when you compare them, compare Joe Biden and Anthony Blinken to Putin and Lavrov, compare Boris Johnson and somebody called Liz Truss to Putin and Lavrov, you've Absolutely. got a golfing class Absolutely. there. You've got a golfing class there, Keith. 
I know. Um, Putin seems to have been bent over backwards to placate the West. And I've watched it diligently for many too years much. now. Too much. Far too much. Uh, Lavrov was right when he said this week that these sanctions are going to make us never again dependent on other people, never again to allow foreigners to be able to strategically damage our economy. We're going to ensure our independence now. And he said we should have done it long ago. And he was right. Absolutely. We should have done it. Yeah, I've found them quite, I've always found very decent people. Look, Russia is a country that needs respect. That's all. And its security concerns to be addressed. That's all. We would insist upon it for ourselves. If, if, if Ireland or Scotland had foreign and hostile nuclear bases in them with rockets, including nuclear rockets, pointed at us, be sure we would insist upon it. If Mexico or Canada had hostile foreign military bases in them with rockets, including nuclear weapons, pointed at the United States, be sure the United States would do something about it. Last word to you, Keith. Just one, two quick questions, George. You've mentioned um, recently that um, you wouldn't have voted for Putin. And I don't quite no, understand. No, I'd, I'd, I'd have voted for the communist. I'd have voted for the communist candidates because they would have acted sooner to ensure the independence right. of Russia. And because so they would have less tolerance uh, for so, the oligarchy, for the crony capitalists in Russia uh, that uh, the Putin has had. Now, Putin has cracked down on the oligarchs, but he needs to crack down more. Putin has made Russia strong again and recovered its prestige again. And I support Putin for that. But in domestic politics, I think that the changes that are required need to be implemented now in this straightened and unusual time, we need a new Russia to emerge from these ashes. Once upon a time, although only briefly, the great majority of people believed the official narrative about 9-11, but that is no longer the case. More and more people are questioning it, including me. And that's both because of the powerful arguments made uh, by the likes of my next guest this evening, uh, but also because I discover that the people that want me to believe their official narrative are caught out as liars over and over and over again. Once bitten, twice shy, you know. Now, Richard Gage is a South, uh, San Francisco Bay area architect. He's a member of the American Institute of Architects, and he's the founder and former chief executive of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. That's all we want, isn't it, Richard? The truth. <laughs> yeah, we're just looking for the truth, George. That's right. And I've been at it for 15 years after creating Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, which now has 3,500 architects and engineers signed onto the petition demanding a new investigation into the destruction of all three World Trade Center skyscrapers on 9-11. Summarize the prevailing view uh, amongst your 3,500. What is it that they doubt and why do they doubt it? Well, I think, George, it starts with World Trade Center Building 7. I mean, this is a 47-story skyscraper that on the afternoon of 9-11, after witnesses hear explosions, suddenly drops straight down uniformly, symmetrically, into its own footprint in under seven seconds. 
This is free fall acceleration. That's as fast as a bowling ball falling out of the sky. That means, and these architects and engineers know this, that all 80 columns had to have been removed at once in order for it to fall without any resistance from any one of them. That's always been the most puzzling aspect. One could talk about the Pentagon, uh, the weirdness of, of, of the story about the Pentagon building, but Building 7 is on the face of it inexplicable, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is absolutely inexplicable because we have, it's the official story, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, you know, eight years later, seven years later, came out with a report. And in the report, they said, well, it came out, it came down due to normal office fires. Well, office fires have never brought down a steel frame fireproof skyscraper in history ever. It just doesn't happen. And yet on 9-11, we have not two, but three protected, uh, fire protected steel frame buildings falling out of the sky. This should be the most studied building failure in history. Remember, no plane hit this building. And most architects and engineers don't even know about the third worst structural failure in modern history. Uh, this is an, a completely unprecedented event. It, sh it should be news throughout the world, and yet it was swept under the rug by our mainstream media and by the associations of professional engineers and architects. I'm a member of the American Institute of Architects. They have 90,000 members. Uh, we didn't receive one bulletin on this incredible uh, fail structural failure and yet we, the architects, are the ones who specify the fireproofing for these buildings. And they were fireproofed, um, uh, all of them, including Building 7, which, was, which wasn't hit by a plane in the Twin Towers. They say that the fireproofing was knocked off by the plane. That's the key point. Uh, we'll turn to the Twin Towers uh, in a minute. But let me launch this poll, uh, Richard. The poll is simple. Do you believe the official 9-11 account? A, yes. B, no. You can vote on my Twitter account, on my YouTube channel, and on my uh, Telegram uh, channel. But that's the key point. Uh, Building 7 was not struck by an aeroplane. So how could it fall like a pa flat as a pancake in its own footprint uh, from quote-unquote normal office fires? Um, and uh, if the story about Building 7 is less than the truth, perhaps even flatly untrue, that of course, in a knock-on effect, calls into question uh, the official narrative of the Twin Towers themselves, doesn't it? Necessarily it does. And when we look at the forensic evidence in the aftermath of all three buildings, we find the evidence of ignited and unignited incendiaries. Now, most of this is provided from official sources, uh, like, for instance, OSHA and, and FEMA themselves, which document extreme temperatures way beyond what jet fuel or office fires can produce. Those are about 500 degrees Fahrenheit to 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, double that. Uh, well, excuse me, uh, cut that in half for, for Celsius. Um, but what we have uh, is the documentation of 2,800 degrees uh, Celsius, excuse me, Fahrenheit, which is about 1,500 Celsius, the, and, in the, and in the forms of molten iron, molten steel, again and again, the, the structural engineers, the World Trade Center structural engineer himself, Leslie Robertson, talking about a river of steel flowing. This, this is, and, and th this is documentation of, of uh, the effects of thermite, as FEMA does in their Appendix C in 2002, which they have a metallurgical examination in the Appendix C, which documents hot sulfur corrosion attack on the steel a liquid molten iron invading the grain boundaries of the steel. Hot sulfur. Where does the sulfur come from? Where does the molten iron come from? Well, that's the byproduct of thermate. 
Thermite is an incendiary used by the military to cut through steel like a hot knife through butter. And Jonathan Barnett says the ends of the beams were partly evaporated. He's the author of a substantial portion of the final report on the on the uh, FEMA, the FEMA uh, report. But NIST came in in 2002, took over the investigation, threw out the metallurgical report, threw out the evidence of explosions at all three towers by hundreds of witnesses, particularly in the case of the Twin Towers. Explosions, uh, they say, running under, like a train running under my feet. Explosions, like pop, pop, pop. They say 